Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hello everyone and happy Valentine's Day. I'm Rose Gerber, the Director of Patient Advocacy and Education for the Community Oncology Alliance. Last year, excuse me, last month, we kicked off our advocacy chat series by focusing on a very broad issue that was the national policy issues that impact patient care. Today, as you can see from the title slide, we're gonna be taking a different approach a different approach to our educational focus today. We're gonna to focus on the much more personal cancer patient experience. I think what all of us know, whether it's through personal experience or maybe through supporting a family member or a friend going through cancer treatment, we pretty much believe that we have a fairly good understanding of what the physical issues are that cancer patients go through. That can include losing hair, it can include mouth sores, losing weight, and a multitude of other issues. What we're realizing now is that as quality cancer care continues to evolve and improve, there is heightened interest in understanding the emotional and mental health needs of cancer patients. And that is going to be the focus of our subject of our advocacy chat today. And please take a close look at the wonderful Marianne Fregola. You can see her full credentials here. She is the Chief of Wellness Services at New York Cancer and Blood Specialist which by the way, is one of the biggest cancer centers serving patients um, in the country. So we're very fortunate to have Marianne with us today, who's gonna educate us on this very important topic. But before we get to Marianne, I'm gonna ask for the slide to be advanced. Um, many of you may recall that I like to take a few minutes talking to you about very high-end issues that are happening with COA. We are definitely having our Hill Day on May 8th. Now you might note on here that I'm specifically mentioning patients and cancer survivors. But this is going to be all inclusive, just like our last time on Capitol Hill, where we brought out nurses, doctors, social workers, um, various members of the clinical team and the administrative team. I am specifically flagging patients and cancer survivors right now to let them know we definitely want you to be included. Uh, right now, as you can see from that very important red asterisk, um, we don't know at this point what states we're targeting. That's going to be a big factor in who will actually attend. But as soon as we know that information, we'll get that out to you. And sometimes there's additional criteria, but the most important thing at this point is to make sure that you save that date and hopefully um, you will be able to join us. And now I would like to turn it over to Marianne Fergola. Thank you for being with us, Marianne, Chief of Wellness Services. Thank you, Rose. I really appreciate you introducing me and thank you, COA, for allowing me to have this opportunity. So of course, I wanna start with a little introduction if you can advance the slide. So, I have been with New York Cancer and Blood now for 23 years. My background was always in oncology. Through that time, I've always been very passionate about helping cancer patients with advanced disease and recognizing what they went through and the real quality uh, impact on their quality of life. Although patients were always grateful for the treatments and the extension, they were still silently suffering. And over time, it took a lot of awareness to begin to see that. So supportive care became something a little newer in the oncology world over the past few years. About three years ago, I implemented a palliative and supportive care program within New York Cancer and Blood Specialists um, after seeing that need again for the supportive care in the community oncology setting. We assessed the quality of life through a study with my patients. I was able to see the direct impact of side effects and what was important to them. And these results were presented to Dr. Jeffrey Vizerko, who is um, the CEO of my company. At the time, he he was consistent with his belief as to what is right for patients, and he supported me in initiating the supportive and palliative care program within our practice. What I wanted to focus on was the whole person care. I wanted to include all the disciplines, not just the cancer diagnosis. So this includes the physical ailments, the psychosocial ailments, spiritual components, and really just what's important to the patient. We focus on the treatment being specific to what their needs are and enhancing the current care that they have using a multidisciplinary team approach as an extra layer of support. Of course, always understanding that the goals of care will change as the trajectory changes. And I bring that up because where you meet a patient on day one may not meet be where they are two or three years later, you know, and, and we're, we're very lucky that these are now chronic illnesses and we can say that statement. Next slide, please. So I have to start with a little background to palliative and supportive care in order to explain why cancer wellness is so important. So this, this topic is cancer wellness. So why am I talking about palliative care? Because we have to change the frame of mind and the misconception. We have to look at this as more of a supportive element. When we support a patient, we support their overall wellness. 
So true to showing a slide, we have to do a, a definition. So the World Health Organization defines palliative care as an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and families facing problems associated with a life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment, treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. Now, again, this does not necessarily only mean cancer. This can mean any chronic illness. Patients suffer through a lot of illnesses. It could be while they're undergoing cancer treatment or even years later. Next slide. When I bring up palliative and supportive care, people cringe. So it's my due diligence just to speak of the common misconceptions. So these are some of the, the things I encounter on my daily practice. Patients can only receive palliative care if they have an end stage or terminal illness. I am not ready for palliative care. That's a big one. People will say when I walk in the room, you know, what is my doctor not telling me? You know, what, what, why are you here? You know, um, and I spend a lot of time educating on the, what my role actually is in that supportive element. Palliative care patients cannot receive curative care. Again, these are misconceptions. Mm -hmm. Palliative care is only for hospitalized patients. It means my doctor has given up on me. And that's huge because when you come into a room to see me, they say, what are you not telling me? And then they think, oh my goodness, what, you know, what did this doctor, you know, pass me on to? And I say, solely, I am an extra layer of support. You know, I work very, very closely with my oncologists, my physicians, and I tell them all the time that they're the ones who are leading the boat, right? I am just that extra layer of support. And if, most importantly, it is an end of life service like hospice. So I wanna say to that statement, all hospice is palliative care. However, not all palliative care is hospice. And you have to retain that statement for a moment. We can palliate anything, any disease. In fact, studies have even proven that earlier palliative care will improve survival and overall outcomes. Next slide, please. Again, going on um, a little more definition and a little more um, honing in on the, the palliative focus, we look to manage symptoms, providing emotional, psychosocial, and spiritual support. Caregiver support is included here as well. You know, the caregivers have such a large burden with their with their family members, and they are the silent sufferers who come to the bedside and to the doctor's offices with the questions and the concerns and, and kind of the real life approach to what's going on because most patients will say, how are you doing today? I'm great. And then you look at the next person in the room and then you get a list of, of what's going on. So we really have to discuss how caregivers are so important in the supportive element. Again, to be repetitive, but just to hone in, it's important that this can be given for any chronic illness at all stages of disease. Um, we try to prevent and manage symptoms while optimizing the quality of life. We've learned that by doing so, people are more compliant in their regimens better compliance, especially with chemotherapy, will lead to better outcomes and, and a, a focus on quality of life. When we focus on the side effects and the person in front of, the, of front of you instead of the disease, it becomes so much more personal. We always talk about personalized medicine, right? And we use these standards of oncology treatment to extend patient's life, but we have to pinpoint what'll help that patient at that time. So if I walk in a room and there's a symptom that's debilitating, it doesn't matter that they're treating cancer. It matters what they are feeling at that moment. So if their nausea that day is, is not letting them get to the next day, they don't wanna come to their next treatment. So when we fix that and make that better and improve that quality of life, they can breathe a sigh of relief. And again, it might not even be something as far as a medication goes. It may be just listening and, and saying, hey, you know, what's on your mind today? Um, and we do provide these along, alongside the therapies intended to cure, control, or support the disease. Luckily, we can say this, that patients live a very long time with chronic cancers now, um, and we can see people through multiple cancers because of all the screening that we do. And I felt that it was important to first discuss this supportive element because that's what leads to the overall wellness of a patient. Next slide. Again, palliative care is supportive care. So we want to change that palliative nature and we want to umbrella it to say that we're looking to support the overall patient and family. And again, controlling symptoms, um, fears to alleviate patients walk in. I've had patients walk into a chemo suite and, and expect pain when they see a chemotherapy. They don't know. They don't know, you know what they, they can't breathe when they walk in because they don't know what to expect. So when you can manage those emotional issues that coincide with this, you can get them past that to come in with an open mind and maybe a better frame of mind. 
We look at the caregiver, of course, again, as I discussed before, we address those spiritual concerns that may be very important to a patient. And then of course, along with the palliative nature is addressing goals of care, advanced care planning and, and associated forms. And that's something we should do um, early on in healthy patients. It should be something that changes as trajectory goes along. And I think that you know anybody with or without an illness should have some knowledge of some of these advanced care forms. And that's scary to talk about, but it is something that is, is a real issue. Next slide, please. So now what is cancer wellness? This is the fun part. Wellness is defined as an optimal state of health for individuals and groups. Very important to say that nobody can define what wellness is for them. It's very unique to the individual. While my background has always been in oncology care for doing this for so long, kind of makes you realize how important whole care is. And yes, you need to treat that disease, but you also have to focus on living well with the disease. Again, because of these chronic long-term illnesses. When we ask about cancer wellness, we focus on living better, whether it be managing side effects or extension of life, it is important to know what is important for that patient. Cancer wellness is a newer thought process, like I stated before. Essentially, we know that patients are living longer after a cancer diagnosis, and I often find that with overall stability is when the real difficult times, times happen. It's hard to then live well. When you are first diagnosed, you're undergoing your, your staging and your treatments and your oncology visits and you're fighting and you have more of a purpose. So you get up and you have a plan. Then you get to a point where you're stable and all of a sudden you're stuck. You don't know where you are. You're waiting for something to happen. I tell patients, they say, I'm doing so well, I'm doing so great, but something's not right. And I say, well, you're waiting for the ball to drop and they breathe a sigh of relief. Mm -hmm. So when we look at this like this, we tell them well, you're living with a chronic illness and that cancer diagnosis does not define you and it's always gonna be there, but now you have to start living well because you you did this chemo for a reason. So it's not always about prescribing a medication. Sometimes it's about discussing something. Everybody is quick to say, leave a visit and say, okay, here's a pill for this symptom. And yes, we do that constantly, but sometimes it's stability and stability is a really scary word. But the long-term impact of cancer diagnoses and their treatments bring other side effects and symptoms that you may not see for quite a while. And, and those are th these are things that we need to address to make it better for that patient. And this is where the many disciplines of wellness will work together to see what is specific for that patient, patient specialized care to help with tailoring the needs of their treatment plan. And Rose, if you have a question, I would love to hear you know, some points of what you're thinking. Yeah, so um, excellent information, Marianne. You said um, a couple of things that really stood out to me and probably stood out to our audience as well. And it was about, and you referred to silent suffering, both for the patient and the caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was really powerful because when you're newly diagnosed, there's um, patients in the audience, I'm a survivor myself. There's a lot of information that you share with your oncologist and your nurse, but a lot of times you just keep a lot to yourself. And that doesn't mean that you're hiding anything. It just means it's too overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you've acknowledged this as part of the care, I think is extremely powerful. And yeah. sometimes all it takes is for that provider, someone like yourself or the nurse to ask a more pointed question, like dig a little bit deeper, ask one more yeah. question yeah. and you're gonna learn a lot. Yeah. Um, also, I think something else very powerful that you mentioned is personalized care. Um, recently, ACS just released, American Cancer Society just released their annual statistics. They do this every year at the beginning of the year. And unfortunately, there's a staggering number of new cancers diagnosed every year. So Marianne, when you say that you're making sure that this is personalized care, I think that is so important because no patient wants to feel like just another number, just another prostate cancer patient, just another breast cancer patient. Um, yeah. So I applaud you for all of that. Thank you. And yeah, we can't lose that element. You know, we all started doing this for a reason. I mean, I, I've been attracted to oncology since I'm 16 years old. It, it's what I gravitate to. But sometimes, you know, it's not a job and we have to realize what's going on. And, you know, starting this program was because of personal reasons, because of what I saw in my own family, because we're all affected by cancer some way or another. Right. But we also don't realize what those patients take home and also what they anticipate to go to that doctor's office. The value of them going to see their oncologist is something I never would have understood had I not been on that other side. And sometimes you go home and you're not sure, you know, what just happened at this visit. So I really, I like to educate a lot and I like to discuss, you know, what do we work on today? So if you are so fearful to walk into the chemo room, then how could we really talk about your whole wellness? It's, it's one symptom at a time. And that's also where you build that rapport for the future conversations that may come. Thank you. Next slide, please. 
again, wellness, and this is a busy slide, but I, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about what I do and I don't want to forget something. So I want to, you know, discuss how wellness considers the whole lifestyle. And, you know, again, we look at your physical, your emotional. I said that a few times and I'm going to get a little more specific now. Um, we don't look at cancer as a wellness aspect, but now we, we do have to, you know, the world now we, we need to start living well and, and we are fighting for a reason. So we want to live our best lives that we possibly can while undergoing treatment. We have tailored plans, including nutrition, um, with proper um, diet plans and nutritional management tailored to the specific needs of the chemotherapy patient. Because we look at nu nutrition as something as, well, you have to eat, you have to eat. And there's a, a very large cultural component, but sometimes that's not the way it could be. We need to tailor what works for that patient undergoing their specific needs. And if nausea is an issue, what we can do to make that better. And and maybe looking at a, at a, at a diet plan differently, it may not be about losing weight or gaining weight, but it may be about maintaining and, and getting those proper nutrients. Same with physical therapy. It's it's such a large part of somebody's treatment plan. Um, work, you know, walking, light walking, any kind of movements can reduce anxiety, depression, and just over and boost overall mood and self esteem. We also incorporate social work and mental health services to improve overall mental health. We use meditation, acupuncture, prayer if applicable, and develop good mind body strategies to be strong enough to fight this disease. Next slide, please. The importance of the cancer wellness and focus of, of, on supportive care. When we improve overall wellness, it improves the overall quality of life. We look at better symptom management, again, leading to better compliance, chemotherapy, radiation therapy. We don't think of some of these other treatments that patients get. Um, when we focus on the supportive element, they just do better. It, it develops a better rapport, open communication for the difficult times. Just that comfortness of having a patient come to you and say, listen, this is a really bad symptom that I'm having right now. Or, you know what, I tried a medication and it's not working. What can we do next? And, and that's something that I like to have a very open dialogue and say, you know, we're going to keep trying until we find something. The first thing we prescribe may not work. But, you know, you're an individual like anything else and your chemicals are different. So we keep trying and we build that rapport so we can have the same mutual goal of improving quality of life. Inclusion of family and caregivers making decisions that, that gives them a sense of purpose when we include them and say, okay, you're telling me one thing and you may be telling me something else. Now let's really talk. And there's no judgment here. So let's feel free. Tell me that you don't feel good. Tell me you don't want to do chemo anymore. And I'll help you to make that best decision. Or maybe you may want to do treatment if you know that we're going to be able to make you feel well with your treatments. Alleviation of fears. When we talk about goal setting and advanced care planning, Nobody wants to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it, but they're real things. And we, we need to know for the future, whether we have a stable illness or a progressive illness, who would make decisions for us if we couldn't do it for ourselves. And sometimes honoring those decisions is the hardest thing that we ever have to do, but we need to discuss and have open communication and not be scared of that. Um, it prevents and alleviates overall suffering. A cancer diagnosis does not define a person. I say this to my patients all the time. This is a small part of your story. This is not you. You come with so much other stuff, but that gets put on the back burner because all you care about at that moment is taking care of the cancer. But what do you like to do when you go home, right? When you feel good, what's your distraction? Your mental health is so important and your distraction to get you away from this diagnosis and what you're dealing with every day. That's the purpose of fighting the diseases so you can live. So take that time to have a cup of tea and read a book and get away from it. It's not all about medicine. It's not all about cancer. It's about what you like. And we don't want to take that away. That's important. So we have to make people feel well enough to do that. Um, and again, studies reveal that patients that do have early palliative care, supportive care, have a greater outcome. Next slide. Developing a wellness plan. So that's a very um, independent individual treatment plan. When you're open and honest with a provider, you have more awareness of how you can bring wellness as part of your cancer care. We can tailor that for each person because goals are, are different. So somebody else may just want to be active um, to walk around and, and take a walk with their grandchildren. It may not be exercise that uh, when we talk about physical exercise, it may not be that you need to go to the gym for 30 minutes a day. It may be that I wanna walk to my mailbox. I wanna walk to the bus stop to pick up my child. It's so much, we look at it in such a great picture, but it couldn't be these little tiny simple things that could make such a huge difference in somebody's life. But when you're moving and you're going through physical therapy, you can do massage, you can do strengthening. You're not on a on a bike doing, you know, aerobic exercise. It's more than that. You know, being more mobile will always prevent debility. So I tell people that you use it or you lose it. And that's with everything in life. And sometimes it's real hard when you're fatigued and you have side effects. 
going from your bathroom to your kitchen may be an, a hard accomplishment, you know, but those are small goals that we set to obtain to, to get better each day. And I think it's very important that we include physical activity um, as part of a physical therapy regime. When we talk about exercise, I mean, I'm sorry, diet as well. We talk about consulting with a registered dietitian nutritionist. I never can say that, an RDN, because that is a credentialed healthcare professional who uses evidence-based information to tailor your nutritional needs. Like I stated before, it's not about gaining weight or losing weight. It's about choices to them, certain yeah. foods, certain cultures, right? It's very independent to what you like. And you have to be open to understanding that what we put on paper may not really be what they're able to do. Um, importance of sleep and, and drinking a lot of water, hydrating yourself, supportive hydration in our practices, just mindfulness over um, your everyday wellness plan. And again, little, little obtainable goals. We want to be realistic and not overwhelm a patient. But I think this also leads to a survivorship type of program where we look for routine screening, overall health, and survivorship has become a very um, a big topic of discussion that we can do a whole webinar on. <laughs> You know, I'm Mary, sure you as you have this, excuse me, um, yeah. I, this slide is really fantastic. And I think another thing that demonstrates is how the patient and the clinical team uh, really do need to support each other. It's really a partnership because the patient is in patient mode, but the clinician has so much incredible insight that you can share it. So I just think this really demonstrates that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Next slide. Obviously, I have to talk about advocacy, right? Oh, wait, we're doing the, the first one. Meet, I, I skipped a slide, apologize. So meeting the patient where they are. This is something that um, I like to tell patients. It, it's a little bit unconventional and I realize that, but one of the philosophies that I've always had is meeting a patient where they are. Not everyone is going to agree with this, but it's how you build a rapport and how you advocate for your patient. We know it's important to advocate and it may look different in the wellness setting, but it's still advocacy. And that's what's important to them. So it can be, conversations about where they are at this moment. Some people don't ever want to talk about, you know, the future moments, but it's still goals and conversations that build up to a means to an end. It can be future things. It can be conservative treatments. Um, maybe they're scared to start treatment or maybe they're scared to stop treatment, but either way, it it's specific to what's important to them. It took me a long time to realize that the patients that are doing really well and that, are, uh, that have passed their chemotherapy and passed their treatments are left with debilitating issues sometimes worse than their diagnosis. And we don't realize that, you know, aren't we happy to say to somebody, your scans are great. You have no disease. And the patient is sitting there and you can see that they're so happy, but, and they don't want to be ungrateful, but they have something that they want to say, right. And their lives have changed dramatically. It's a new life. It's a new life. And, and we have to acknowledge that and, and let them know that you're not ungrateful that you are, are in remission, right. But you have a new life to live now. And, and we have to, support them and give them the treatments we can to make them live as best as they can with those debilitating side effects that they may have. Um, and also just to anyone in the audience, if you have any questions for Marianne, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A, excuse me, either one. <laughs> Go ahead. Next slide. What I was saying before, a moment about advocacy. Obviously with COA, it's a huge um, channel. Uh, and I need to say that, you know, when we talk about wellness and we talk about supportive care, uh, we do need policies and standards that will include this as part of their um, in, ensuring that it's essential component of their programs and their care. Having access to therapies for pain relief, palliative and supportive care is important. That includes wellness, making sure that palliative care is part of health services, whether it's community setting, hospital based um, or health based programs, very important to have and that there's a team there that can provide at least basic palliative care and then send out to specialists if needed. Um, we always have to consider social determinants of health. That's very important. We want everybody to have access to care. Um, that's a, a very up and coming topic that is uh, essential to integrating to into palliative care uh, policies and procedures. And again, incorporating training as part of ongoing education is something important for universities and teaching hospitals as well. Um, I love educating. I think it's important that we put the word out there. And, and that's why I did focus a lot on supportive elements to this today's topic is because it's the education that leads us to the discussion of what overall wellness is. And even though it sounds um, simple to say that everything is so patient specific and unique to somebody, it's not, that's not clinical for me to say that. But when you look at somebody's clinical outlook and you, you focus in on what's important to them, that's where the specialty care comes in. 
And of yeah. course, I love the slide, Marianne, because that's the exact purpose of these advocacy chats is to provide education, but also insert the advocacy front. And you said that Co is very well known, you know, for being on Capitol Hill, uh, the, the, the quick dial to members of Congress. But advocacy is also self-care. And, and so I love the way that you pulled that in together. And it Thank looks you. like we have a question. Let me take a quick look. Oh, very nice. It's an excellent presentation. So <laughs> thank, you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that positive. Yeah, thank <laughs> You're you. doing great. I told you. Yeah, that's, you know, it's been the education part of the supportive element has been one of my passions. And anybody that knows me knows that. And sometimes I get too passionate and a little too repetitive um, because I just want to put that word out there on, on how much a palliative team can change and a supportive team can change the overall wellness because you don't think of that when you think of supportive care. You you overlook the wellness aspect of it. And here in my practice, I really am uh, trying my best to consult with all of my teams and make sure that we can offer these services to our patients. Next slide, please. So this is just my contact information. Um, obviously, I would love questions. If people have questions right now, that would be great. Um, I work with New York Cancer and Blood Specialists. I do consulting remotely for all of our locations. Um, I have an excellent team here, so I have to give that little plug. And uh, again, thank you, Rose and Koa, for allowing me this opportunity. I'm, I'm super grateful. I'm going to send it back to you now. Thank you, Marianne. And uh, again, no worries where you send us this message, Q&A or any, anywhere else. We did get a really good question. How do you help someone who lives alone and is receiving chemo and radiation. I think that is an excellent question. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, we have a social work team, obviously, that we work with to provide transportation. Um, we have a few, uh, and we're very blessed because we have a New York Cancer Foundation as well that can help support patients that need um, financial assistance as well. So we have a good mental health uh, establishment in place where we would have a social worker reach out, uh, provide transportation if we can get that done for them to and from their chemotherapy and their doctor's offices. Uh, we are also able to do, I am anyway, able to do video consultations. Um, nice. And yeah, which is great because I can actually see the patient and, you know, be able to help side effect management wise for that chemo and radiation, because that, that's a huge component. And then they would see their oncologist in person, of course, but at least it alleviates that um, extra visit. So yeah, so our team would work interdisciplinary together to try to get that patient what they need. Um, it's interesting that you pointed out that you're still offering video consultations because again, after COVID, a lot of that ceased. So that's good to know. Some people don't want to drive in or might not be healthy enough. So, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, we're, we're blessed. Yeah, because again, they do have the radiation every day or the chemo every week and, and, they're, but they're, and they have to see their oncologist in person. So as a specialist, if I'm able to do that, I, I would love that. Okay, we have another. How do we educate our oncologists of the need for ongoing supportive care after we achieve stability with stage four? And yeah, stage four, that metastatic is scary. Can you answer that? Or do you want me to repeat the question? Oh, absolutely. I can answer that. That's an excellent question. And the education is the key word there. So, you know, you're, you have to be as a stage four cancer survivor, living survivorship, you have to advocate for yourself. So I've had plenty of self-referrals. People will see my name somewhere or my title or my education that I do. And they say, we want to visit with them. Anybody can see a palliative team or supportive team. And that's where we, we lead to survivorship. And so you just ask somebody, I would like to see a palliative specialist and you are able to get a, you know, an appointment. Thank you so much, Marianne. And to everyone in the audience, if we can get advanced, we have just two more slides. Okay, this is uh, the school of thought that when something's really, really important, you repeat it a couple of times. And Marianne, you did that, which is very useful. <laughs> Um, so again, I had this slide at the beginning of uh, Marianne's at the beginning of our advocacy chat today. Um, if you are a patient or survivor that was treated in an independent community oncology setting, and you think you might be interested, even though we don't know what states we're targeting just yet or exactly what our focus will be, but you want to you want to make sure that you find out um, about these details, you can definitely email me at rosegcoacancer.org. at coacancer.org. Once again, Rose G at coacancer.org. Um, and I know that going to Capitol Hill is very exciting and hopefully we'll be able to bring a lot of you with us. Next slide, please. Okay, let's see one. We're gonna go to the, let's see we have, I'm sorry, we have one more, a couple, we have a couple more questions. So if anybody would like to stay around, um, please do, but I do, um, I'm very happy that you're all so engaged. So let's, uh, Marianne, can you address uh, some of these questions? Yeah, so absolutely. I'll, you okay. want me to chat them that way you can, you can do your slide. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Oh, perfect. Uh, any <laughs> self-help resources for patients about palliative care? 
So that's a good question. I think it depends on where what you know where you are, um, where you're living. Um, but yes, of course, the American Cancer Society, of course, and there are lots of palliative and supportive care websites that you can look at. But you know, always look at a local oncology office as well. Um, but it, with the way of Google nowadays, you can look at real, you know, good websites for palliative and supportive care resources. Okay. Um, and let me. Yep. The next yeah, one I was going to say. Great. Another... But, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I have a colleague who is very family friendly, frustrated community. Communicate. Yep. Okay. Yes. Communicating his wife's diagnosis, treatment progression between the physicians and family members who wanted real time updates from him on their solutions. Well, yeah, that, you know, again, I'm very blessed because my oncologists are so um, receptive to palliative support. So a lot of times I have patients come in and we do go over all their questions and I communicate with the oncologist. Um, you can ask for family discussions, obviously, um, but it can get frustrating when you have multiple team members, you know, communicating or not communicating with you. But again, advocating for yourself and asking for those resources um, for the emotional support, social work, nutrition, um, for the for the educational component of of keeping yourself healthy and just speaking with your med onc doctor to say, hey, we really want to have a team meeting or a, a family discussion, family conference. This has been fantastic, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you. And again, thank you to our audience. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, the purpose of these advocacy chats is to provide education. We go from what's happening in Washington, D.C. to learning today what the providers can do to support patients. And next month is going to be extremely interesting. Many people may have heard the name Trevor Maxwell. He's an absolutely incredible cancer survivor who's doing a lot of work on the national in the national oncology space. And what's extra notable is, unfortunately, we don't see a lot of men involved in advocacy. I apologize for that. Um, we don't see a lot of people, men involved in advocacy. So please join us. This is going to be extra special. And thank you. And happy Valentine's Day again. Thank you, Marianne. We'll thank you so much time. again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.